It's kind of uh, strange to go right from doing the Lord's Supper to the sermon, but I'm going to try to do that. <laughs> um, I wanted to get back into our series of the origins of life. And last time we were talking about um, something very, very necessary for uh, macroevolution to be true. Uh, we were talking about some troubling mutations, and there are a few things we didn't get to that I want to cover um, hopefully quickly um, this morning. Some of you might be wondering why, why I'm doing this. Some of this material may not appeal to a lot of us. Um, we might think, you know, why are you turning this into a science class? more than into a sermon, and, and I understand those thoughts. But I've said many times before, uh, I'm tired of Christians, and especially young Christians, being made that they have to apologize for their faith in God. I have sat in college classrooms and been told that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all just made up myths. I sat there as a professor tried to convince me and show evidence that that was the case. I'm tired of young Christians wanting to improve their life by furthering their education on a college level or university level and being made that not only do they need to apologize for their faith, that they need to give it up. I don't believe the answer, and, and I'm not trying to suggest that as parents we have to keep our kids out of college and university, but I want our kids to be prepared and I want to show you something that comes from a very honest professor. He wrote this when he was alive. He died in 2007. But he is a professor and a philosopher from Stanford University. And again, if, if you know someone that went to or goes to Stanford or anything like that, they haven't done anything wrong. But this is what he says. He says, I, like most Americans who teach humanities or social science in colleges and universities, invoke when we try to arrange things so that students who enter as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. What I want you to notice is these words. Bigoted, homophobic, Religious fundamentalists. Who's he talking about? He's talking about you and me. He's talking about Christians. And I'm not trying to point this out that this is just one rare case of some college. Pro this is the very typical college professor. Are they all like this? No. But a great number of them are. This is how they see Christians. And so they believe it is their goal, their duty to take your kids and to, to make them to have more views like they have to look at Christianity this way than the way that their parents have taught them. He goes on to say, when we American college teachers encounter religious fundamentalists, we do not consider the possibility of reformulating our own practices of justification so as to give more weight to the authority of the Christian scriptures. Now he uses the term Christian. He didn't use it before. He used those other terms. But what is he saying? He's saying, I don't feel like I need to change. I feel like your students, your kids need to change. He goes on to say, instead we do our best to convince these students of the benefits of of secularization, worldliness. 
They want to teach them the wisdom from below, not the wisdom from above. We assign first-person accounts of growing up homosexual to our homophobic students for the same reason that German school teachers in the post-war period assign the diary of Anne Frank. You have to be educated in order to be a participant in our conversation. There's the snobbery. We are educated. You aren't. But I'm going to educate you. You see the arrogance? So we're going to go right on trying to discredit you in the eyes of your children. Trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity. Trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. Boy, that, that's just great debate, isn't it? Well, in other words, we're going to call you names. Isn't that a great way to argue with people and prove your point? We're not going, uh, we are not so inclusivist as to tolerate intolerance such as yours. I love tol uh, tolerance, right? You have to tolerate me, but I don't have to tolerate you. We're tolerant people, but I'm not going to tolerate that. You see what he's saying? He goes on to say, I don't see anything. And look at that German word. I can't even pronounce that. It means domination free. I don't see anything domination free about my handling of my fundamental students. Rather, I think those students are lucky to find themselves under the benevolent domination of people like me. And to escape the grip of their frightening, vicious, dangerous parents. Let that soak in. That's how they view you. That's how they view Christian parents. I am just as provincial and contextualist as the Nazi teachers who made their students read Der Strummer. The only difference is that I serve a better cause. Well, that's open for debate. I'm not telling you that you can't send your kids to, to college or university. What I, I, I want you to do, I want you to, to have your eyes wide open. And if you think that you can have your kids and just kind of milk toast the word of God to them and not study the word of God and implant the importance of knowing why God is God and why we can believe in God and that the Bible truly is the revelation of God. If you think that you can send them to these college campuses and, and, and not really emphasize and ground them on the Word of God, you're fooling yourself. That's why I'm doing this. Because I've had that experience. And I'm tired of, of, of seeing good Christian young people go to college and then come out not believing in God at all. It is not a silly thing to believe in God. You're not a homophobe. You're not bigoted. That's just name calling. That's not, that's not the way you win arguments. That's not the way you debate your points. But there's a whole group of people in this world, and we need to make sure that we're not one of them, that have no idea how to stand up for their point and be a human being at the same time. Amen? Amen? I love this passage in Hebrews 3, verse 4. I'm going to use it again. For, the house, for every house is built by someone, right? Even a radial shack we can see. Someone built this. There's, there's a designer. There's someone that constructed this. But then when we look at things that are more complex than a house, when we look at genetics, DNA, when we look at, at, at life at the cell level, we see great complexity, 
far more complexity and organization and orderliness than a house built by someone. But we are told, we are foolish to believe that every builder or the builder of all things is God. It makes no sense. We've been deceived as a world, as a people. And what we're seeing that we dislike so much in our, in our country, all these things that make us upset and, and, and fill with anxiety about the future, it's just a trickle down of that decision to allow people to think we're foolish to be Christians. So we're going to go back in the classroom. We know that there's an old answer. We know there's a new answer. We know the new answer comes because we don't like the old answer. And we're looking at DNA. We're looking at genes, genetic reproduction. We're looking at, in particular, mutations, which we talked about last time is simply a mistake. And as we talk about this, I, I want you as the jury to ask yourself, what is more reasonable given the facts of the evidence? The old theory, an intelligent designer, a creator, or by chance and circumstance, what we call evolution. You see, the thing about this, we always hear talk about evolution as, as chance and circumstance, but sometimes you're like, well, what is the chance and circumstance? What does that mean? Well, that's what we're talking about right here. That all this came about by chance and circumstance. That's what we're describing in this lesson. And so what we have to be able to see, reasonably see, is how one organism can have all of this genetic action, these mutations that are changing the, the form of the body to where a fin can become a leg. Or a fishtail can become a lizard tail. In other words, there has to, to be proof, reasonable proof, that the genetic mutations can change enough in this animal so that one animal becomes another animal. One species becomes another. Let me explain to you the, the old way that they used to think of this. Here is that... Um, DNA, we saw it last week, or a couple weeks ago. It's kind of the, the latter. These amino acids pair up together. And, and the, the incredible thing is, if I was to, to try to explain to you how all of this DNA functions and reproduces and, and how it figures all this stuff out, number one, I would not do it justice because it is so complex. Your head would be spinning. My head would be spinning. These things work to where multiple things are working together, coming on and functioning at the right time, turning off at the right time, going to the right place, doing the right thing, then returning to the place at once. Well, I mean, it's incredibly complex. But it's also incredibly beautiful. And so what happens is this ladder of DNA that kind of twists and turns, it, it, it just knows that at some point it splits. And this, this goes off and it makes a copy of itself and it goes out and synthesizes and makes proteins and it does what it's supposed to do. And at some point it comes back and the ladder perfectly goes back together. Every amino acid uh, pair brings up together just exactly the way it was, except for sometimes there's a mistake. Sometimes the original, like here, an amino acid T becomes C. That's what we call a mutation. It's a mistake. It's not supposed to happen. Over 99% of these mutations are bad. They don't help the organism. And many of them are lethal. They lead to death. They lead to deformity. Well, the way that they used to think about these is that given enough time and, and circumstance, there's your chance of circumstance, uh, you, you've got enough bad uh, ones, eventually 
there does come to be by odds something that's good, a, a good mutation, something that actually is positive in a mutation. And so what, what happens is you basically have this idea that you have these mutations that happen. You've got a bad mutation, bad, 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 good. Bad, 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 good. And you get the point. But what happens from evolutionary standpoint, all of those bad mutations are in existence. What happens to them? Natural selection. They're bad. They're weak. They don't. They're not as as uh, adapted to the environment, and so they die off. And that's what happens. The, the 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 good mutations are left. But even in those, you have to have enough time to have enough good mutations and enough good mutations that go from one generation to another generation to another generation to eventually where one species becomes another species. Is it reasonable to think that a mistake, given enough chance and circumstance, enough time, can turn one animal into another? Well, for a long time, they, they had trouble with that. Because the fossil record didn't show all of these intermediate forms. You had animal here, animal A, and animal B. Well, that was a problem. I want to share this with you uh, from Mitchell and Sandra Hall in their book, The Truth, God, or Evolution. Uh, they talk about Charles Darwin. Did, what about Darwin? Did he know about these mutations? When he wrote their Bible, this is basically their Bible, his book, The Origins of Species, written in 1859. Well, as you look at Charles Darwin and, and his book in 1859, what do you know? There's a lot of things Charles Darwin couldn't see. He couldn't know. They didn't know how of the technology. He couldn't uh, see down to the cell level. And he knew that. He was honest that there were things limited that he thought would be discovered later. Well, Darwin was aware of mutational differences, but did not consider them important due to the fact that they were disadvantageous. He said natural selection would eliminate them, so he didn't put a lot of stock in them. But as macroevolutionists used his theory and organized it into what we know as neo-Darwinism, um, they put all sorts of stock in that. And so for evolution to be true, there has to be enough beneficial mutations, enough to lead to another species. These mutations have to be passed on not only to one animal, one generation, but to the next generation. Natural selection has to eliminate the bad mutations. But here's the problem. Science hasn't proven any of this. It's not proven. And so this slow evolution where, you know, slowly the fin turns into a leg and the tail turns into a lizard tail, uh, it gave them problems until they discovered hox genes. Now, hox genes is part of DNA. It's, it's part of that whole process we're talking about. But they discovered something in fact, it, it was all the way down, uh, not too far from here, uh, at the University of California, San Diego. Biologists at the University of Sandy, uh, California, San Diego have uncovered the first, now listen to this, have uncovered the first genetic evidence that explains how large-scale alterations, a fin becomes a tail, to body parts, plans, he says plans, but kind of the idea, body plans, body parts, were accomplished during the early evolution of animals. Now, what he's referring to is certain experiment or experiments done. And what I want you to understand is the experiments are the fact that he's drawing from. 
But right here, when he says the first genetic evidence that explains how large-scale alterations to body plans were accomplished during the early evolution of animals, what is that? It's theory. It's opinion. But he doesn't tell you that. He writes it as, well, this is a fact. Here's what that evidence shows. And this is why I have a problem with this. We don't separate fact from theory. We move on. He says the achievement is a landmark in evolutionary biology, not only because it shows how new animal body plans could arise from a simple genetic mutation, but because it effectively answers a major criticism creationists had long leveled against evolution. What I just described. You don't see all of these evolved animals, right? You don't see these intermediate forms. They all show up all of a sudden in the fossil record. Animal A is there, animal B is there. How do we get from A to B? Well, they say it's the Hox gene. The absence of genetic mechanism that could permit animals to introduce radical new body designs. So here's the problem they had. They didn't have that evidence. Now he thinks they do. So take a deep breath. Clear your head. I hope you're still with me. Here's what they think has happened with these Hox genes. They believe they have solved the problem of slow evolution. Now mutations develop in silence. You can't really see them. And appear for some reason all of a sudden just like the fossil record shows. So in other words, what they're saying is now that we discover these Hox genes, what we discover is like that fish, he's evolving. Those fish are evolving. You just can't see it. It's in silence. And then all of a sudden, something wakes up those mutations. And, and all of a sudden, you can see them in this new creature. Now you see the lizard all of a sudden one day, just like the fossil record. Mutations could spread silently. And almost suddenly mutated offspring that would be the birth of a species. What you're getting there is a whole lot of opinion from Jeffrey Schwartz. So one of the big experiments they did that, that's drawing all of these things was that they experimented on fruit flies. And what they discovered is that these researchers could actually manipulate, now listen to me carefully, researchers, scientists could manipulate, they could work on these fruit flies and they can make changes using these hot genes Hox genes to these fruit flies. And the reason why they use fruit flies is one, fruit flies reproduce very quickly. You know, with human beings, you've got to wait nine months to get an offspring. You've got to wait about 20 years. Most people think about a generation comes every 20 years. That's a long time. But with fruit flies, you could speed that up. And so you can create lots of generations of fruit flies very, very quickly. And so that's why fruit flies were chosen for this experiment. So as they manipulated the genetic code, the genetic language, the reproduction of these fruit flies, scientists discovered they could alter the Hox genes and thus creating mutations, mistakes, within these uh, organisms. They were able to change eye color, they were able to grow a leg where there had been an antenna. They were able to multiply the number of wings from two to four. They were able to change the eye size, the eye type, and many other manipulations. And they thought, great, here's the proof that these genetic mutations could eventually lead to a new animal, a new species. So here you have the genetic manipulation testing, and I don't know how well you can 
can see this, but what you have here, let's see if I can, whoops, that's not what I wanted. All right, so right here, what you have is they were able to create a generation of fruit flies without wings. They were able to create fruit flies with bent wings, with eight legs, with dark bodies, with dark red eyes, with stick-like eyes. They were able to manipulate all of these these um, fruit flies to all these different features. And they created generation after generation after generation after generation of these fruit flies. And they thought, man, we've got it. But here's the problem. After all of these fruit flies being manipulated and changed, what you had in the end was just a bunch of messed up fruit flies. You didn't have another creature. There wasn't a new species that was formed. Because not only do you have to be able to see a change in the, the form of the body, it's got to be a positive change. A fruit fly with no wings is not a positive change. And you might think a fruit fly with eight, eight legs is, is something positive, but it's not. In fact, these fruit flies would have eventually come to destruction because of natural selection. You see, we still have that gap, that giant leap of faith where we go from small-scale microevolution to large-scale macroevolution. And Hox genes are not the answer. Hawk's genes shows us exactly what we already know. Genes can be changed within a kind, within a species. E.H. Andrews says, it is not possible for a code, and what he's talking about is the DNA code. It's not possible for a code of any kind to arise by chance or accident. The laws of chance or probability have been worked out by mathematics. He says you can actually use mathematics to figure out if the DNA code, the DNA language, could come by chance and circumstance. He says it, it can't. The math shows it's impossible. A code like DNA is the work of an intelligent mind. That's the only reasonable answer, he says. May Thompson and Harob say, in the end, after mutations have occurred, no macroevolution has taken place. None! Let us not lose sight of the forest for the trees. You see, the, the, that's what happened. The fruit flies are the trees. But in the end, all you had was a forest of fruit flies. They couldn't see that. Herman J. Mueller says, Accordingly, the great majority of mutations, certainly well over 99%, are harmful in some way as to be expected of the effects of accidental occurrences. Evolutionists believe that mistakes, given enough chance and circumstance, given enough time, given natural selection, can lead from one species to another species. Is that reasonable? Is that more reasonable than believing in an eternal creator, an intelligent designer, seeing the complexity, the orderliness, the construction of it all, of this DNA system? I'll let you decide. But I want Christians to know. I want our young people to know that a belief in God is not crazy. 
You're not lacking intelligence. You have not been brainwashed by your parents. One of the funniest things about all of this, this fruit fly experiment, and this is why I tried to emphasize, researchers worked upon the fruit flies. Researchers manipulated the genetic code. It's like one of my favorite cartoons. Here's this scientist working in the laboratory, and he says, if I can just synthesize life here, then I'll have proven that no intelligence was necessary to form it in the beginning. It's funny because he's saying he's not intelligent. It's funny because he doesn't recognize, even if he was able to do it, he's the intelligence working on it. So if you go to college or university, just know you're being taught by people who don't believe in God or the Bible or Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't stop them from making firm affirmations and teaching those subjects. But you're not going to get the truth. You're not going to get what you hear here among your brethren because they're not willing to leave that door open. They're not even willing to crack that door one inch that Jesus could cast out demons by the power of God. Remember where we started all this? So what else are they going to say? And when you don't have a very strong argument to begin with, most of the time what you end up with is name calling. A bunch of bigoted, homophobic fundamentalists. But Christians are none of those things. And I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that if you let the world convince you that God is not real and that his word is not inspired and that you allow the world to take you away from the, the great salvation of Jesus Christ, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. I want our young people to be baptized in Christ, but I want them to be baptized in Christ because it is their choice, not their parents. I want them to be baptized into Christ because they want a relationship with Jesus Christ. That they want Him to be their Savior. And I know you want the same thing. And so if anyone is ready or whenever you're ready, let us know. And we'll make you into a child of God. Let me put it this way. We'll help you become that child of God. Thank you so much. Let's go into our singing service now.